Deus Ex Machina Chapter 1 Stories of Olden Life A moon as red as the deepest rose hangs over the sky tonight. I look upon it with a sudden sadness and wonder if it will ever shine golden for me again. Will I see my love's face reflected on its surface for the remainder of all Eater Nighty? Will I be subjected to this fate until every iota of consciousness is scrubbed from my being? Still I wait. Still I miss her. Gods offer salvation, but it oft ends as a doe blee-edged blade with a blood-red hilt. Legends speak of heroes who, in dire moments, sealed packs in blood. These brave souls, whether warriors on the battlefield, star-crossed lovers yearning to reunite with their soulmate, or ALING children teetering on the brink of death, all found themselves at the precipice of existence. Tales such as these weave together individuals forced to confront unimaginable trials, both physical and mental, to grasp the elusive opportunity to barter with the very forces of life and death. The gods, in their capricious wisdom, would occasionally entertain such exchanges, breathing life back into the souls who dared to bargain. Not everyone was destined to receive this divine gift, yet the possibility of a deal remained open to any who dared to tread where mortals and deities converged. My father had shared with me countless STO rise of these heroic feats, passed down through the ages. He spun legends of many courageous champions and their quests to procure the favor of the gods their journeys often connecting to his own youthful fascination with the divine. Amid the soft, flickering glow of the oil lamps, the stories felt more vivid, as if they lived and breathed in his room. The room itself exuded a sense of timelessness, its wooden walls imbued with the wisdom of generations. The lamps, with their gentle flames, cast enchanting, ever-moving shadows, like spectral dancers in a nocturnal reverie. In this chamber, the past and present converged, where stories mingled with reality, and the line between the two grew in these tinct. His name was Abraxas. My father began one sullen night. He was the kind of hero you envision in your mind when you close your eyes. Radiant. Flaxen hair, build the size of a mountain, and a voice like a demon. He fought for the empire in his early days, working his way up the chain of command. You see, Orleth is full of soldiers from here to there, but standing out, becoming an icon, become ING a hero, that's what Braxis yearned for. He'd grown up in a family much larger than we have here. Siblings from wall to wall, it drove in him a deep desire to stand out. Did he kill lots of men? I had remembered asking. Stories about soldiers typically featured them going on sprees of mass destruction. I'm very sure he had, my father answered. He was a terror on the battlefield. Many considered him a one-man army. I'm sure if he had made it longer he would have become a warlord in his own right. But unfortunately, as strong as he may be, by himself he was still but a man. Even in that sort of state. Why did the Empire need such a man? I asked. My puzzled look must have amused him as such a thing hadn't seemed anything less than obvious. Why such men like him? That is a question I wish I had a better and swear for, my father said, his shoulders slumping. The world back then began with this. This deter. Mind how life communicated with one another before more complex speech developed in their individual UAL communities. Armies were gathered roughly and soldiers fought simply to protect this. This was mine. This was yours. This was the origin of all that we know. How could you tell what this was yours or not? Surely some people thought that this could be more than one person's. An all-knowing smile gleamed on my father's face as the question escaped my lips, a string of thoughts that sprung from a child who had not yet learned the violence of the world. My curiosity, innocent and untainted by the harsh realities of the world, led me to seek understanding. Easy. You could tell if this was yours if you could kill anything who did not agree with you. Back when this was that, it was very easy to distinguish ownership. People very rarely had their this, whatever it ended up being, for very long. 
There usually was always someone stronger that came along, someone more deserving, more angry. That was long ago, and yet, he hung on the thought as if contemplating. My father's voice held the weight of experience, his gaze distant as he reflected on the turbulent past. It was a history that felt both distant and alarmingly close. It wasn't as long as I would like to think. There are still those of us that were alive when this was like that. They've been those of them that have best adapted to how things are now. Abraxas, now he had been one who had held on to his this for a very, very long time. Unfortunately, like the rest, his this was taken from him, and he begged the gods, of course, being of the empire, that request would have been sent directly to Oreos. That's the truth God, right? I had asked, try ING to remember. It was clear it was still difficult for me to get the names and associations down. My father shook his head. No, Oreos is the Patron deity of light. While close, he would not dare claim dominion over truth from Nervos. Both of Oriletha's gods would sooner see their empire in flames than lose their mantles to the other. Think of them like bitter lost loves. As I grappled with the intricate web of deities, their domains, and rivalries, I couldn't help but feel overwhelmed by the complexity of it all. My father's patient explanations were my guide through this maze of divine figures. From what I remembered, Oros was very proud, often the source of the ignored requests from the Empire. The enigma of why people continued to put their faith in a god who seemed so distant weighed on my young mind. However, the unspoken rule of not questioning the patron gods remained firm, and I dared not voice my doubts. The air in the room seemed to thicken with the weight of tradition and devotion, a reminder that the gods, though capricious, held immense influence in the lives of the Empire's citizens. Oros let Abraxas' request hang in the clouds, unfulfilled. You see, it isn't just salvation from death that deals could be made, but that's what most of them tended to be. The gods don't deal in salvation for small matters, usually. What happened next? I asked. He went mad. Now, outsiders might have considered him mad before, and I wouldn't doubt that assertion but he had only used his strength previously to protect what he claimed his. After his madness, though, he was nearly unstoppable. He began raging relentlessly, striking down any he could find. Those he used to call friends, his superiors, they all fell to the same crimson fury. I remember at this time how different this story felt to the others my father had told me. There was more detail in the motivation, the account was not from a third-hand experience. I looked up to my father with a growing sadness in my voice. Did you know Abraxas' father? My father's face was a patchwork of emotions as he spoke, his eyes filled with memories and unspoken regrets. The room around us felt like a cocoon of stories and secrets, the ancient oak walls bearing silent witness to a lifetime of experiences. It's not an easy thing, existing. You know that? I listened intently, perched on my father's knee, my small frame feeling safe and cherished in his embrace. Sure, you're doing it now, but to continue to exist, that there is the difficult part. And often one must make difficult decisions, the kinds of decisions you'll have to live with for the rest of your life. That's the kind of decision that these people had to make in order to survive, in order to make it to now, where those kinds of decisions are no longer necessary. Abraxas for a long time made a lot of difficult desi science, but eventually some of those who knew him had to make some of their own. They, they were forced to in order to survive. Did you have to make any decisions like that? He knew what I had been asking, and up to this point had tried his hardest to say it indirectly. I was one of the few who helped bring Abraxas to the end of his rampage. It brought about a lot of misery thereafter but ultimately it needed to be done. My father paused as he shifted and sat me up on his leg. That I think will be enough for now, Mal. We've already stayed up much too late past your bedtime. With a gentle touch, my father let me down from his lap, signaling the end of our conversation for the night. The room seemed to exhale, 
the weight of the stories lifting as we return to our everyday life. The knowledge that my father had served in the empire and faced challenging decisions was a heavy burden for a child to bear, but it was also a part of what made him who he was. I remember wanting to know more, wanting to know if it had anything to do with where mom went. I had known so little at the time. My father served in Orleth for a time. The empire had situated itself as a continental superpower in Etheria's north. That wasn't where we lived then, where I had grown up. The empire may as well have been a land of dreams for all I knew. Over time, the bedtime stories grew less and less frequent, and as such, time with my father was typically spent in the chores I did around the house to help him once he was finished with his work. After leaving the army the empire my father and mother settled down to the neighboring land of Cadian, a city sustained in the sky to the empire's south. According to him it was the place they had always wished to run away to. The city itself at night lit up the southern skies and meant freedom for the both of them. He had taken up metallurgy to support his growing family, as I had been at that time grow ING in my mother's stomach. My mother, she passed shortly after I was born. I don't remember a lot about her, only a single frame of her smiling down at my infant self remains in my memory to this day. Among the many things my father keeps from me, like the stories of his past as a soldier, it's the things about my mother that I yearn for the most. I didn't even know her name. Now, with the Empire's forges heating up as the ceasefire with Esther in the east seemed to be small daring, my greatest fear is a conscription from Oreleth sending its fetid claws to our neck of the woods, the Empire reclaiming its property. One never truly leaves the Empire. Mal. I hated the whole thing. All of it could do without any of it. Why did the Empire have to keep sending its people to death in these endless fights over conflicts that don't ultimately matter? Why must our fathers be forced to work for the blood ma chine that is never satiated? Malachi. My father's voice brings me back to focus. I'm standing in front of a black cloud billowing up toward the ceiling. I sighed. Ah, shoot, I say sheepishly. I sigh as I stand in front of the black cloud bill lowing up towards the ceiling. Charred muscarib fills my nostrils, bringing tears to my eyes. Malachi, my father's voice brings me back to focus. I turn to see him, a tall, imposing figure in a stark contrast to my own wiry frame. Ah, shoot, I say sheepishly. Nearly start a fire and the most you let out with is shoot. I'd hate to hear what comes out if someone guts you like a fish, he says sarcastically. I'm sorry, I said. My father, the soldier that has never left him. My father's eyes slide over to me with an imperceptible annoyance. He sighs as well. The thoughts of my past spill out as the smoke replaces it. Sorry, was caught up on things. I've been thinking a lot lately. I push open the window to let the stale kitchen air out. As the warm morning light spills in, it bathes the kitchen in a golden glow, contrasting the potential reprimand I was about to receive. My father sighs and rubs his temples. I know it's not been easy for you, he says, but you must keep your attention on the food while you're cooking it. We don't need a repeat of last time. His shoulders slump as he crosses the kitchen in a few quick strides. I may have accidentally started a fire, twice. I feel horrible about it. My mind sometimes just wanders. And if it becomes disconnected, it becomes harder to get back to where I should be. I was admittedly too young to be working the ovens the last time it happened. That must have been, gosh, seven or eight years ago now. I'm not going to let that happen again, I'm sorry, I said, grabbing the spike and using it to lift the charred remains of meat out of the pan. I lifted the entire pot out of the oven, nearly losing it as I lean in closer to save it. I'll go out and catch some more grub. My father sighs and shakes his head. It's no bother. We've got some in the back. I can go grab it, provided you don't char this one. I move to answer but a knocking at our front door steals both of our attention. 
Tell them we're not open for another hour. My father barks as he moves back to the refrigeration unit. Through my exhale, I set the spike down and open the door. Hello, is this the residence of Logrith End? The man that stands before me is shorter than I expected, but I can tell from the lines on his face he must have been at least three times my age. His dirty blonde hair is cut in an arc around his head, and if I hadn't recognized the imperial regalia on the chest of his coat, I might have let out a small laugh at how unfitting his proportions are to his hair. The moment my eyes cross the crimson lion with the orb meant to represent the sun within its jaws, my heart sinks. What is he doing here? Are you mute, boy? Am I in the right place to find Logrith End? He's... Right here. My father's voice saves me from finishing my thought, and instantly I regret how I couldn't save him. He appears behind me, resting his hand on the door frame as he looks out over my head to the man below. The tension is palpable when his gaze sets on the Imperial. To what do I owe the plea sure of a house call? The man's steely gaze never wavers as he extends a sealed letter bearing the Imperial emblem. My apologies if I've interrupted your morning. I bear a message from Emperor Eugolius himself. He wishes to see you, Logrith End, at the earliest convenience. The contents of this letter may shed some light on the urgency of the matter. My father takes the letter, the edges of his mouth barely curling upward as he recognizes the seal. I see. I will read it immediately. With a nod, my father breaks the seal and starts to read the letter. His eyes move quickly across the page and it's clear that he's processing the words with great concentration. After a few moments, he lowers the letter, his expression unreadable. My father glances at me, his eyes holding a mixture of uncertainty and concern. The Imperial cocks his head, looking at my F.A. though with an unusual look. I would most certainly love to discuss the details of this outside of this musty environment you cling to. The Imperial rubs his fingers in distaste. We rarely get visitors from the Empire because they don't tend to like the change in elevation. If you spend enough time on the surface, entering Kadeen can really mess with your insides. At least, according to my father, the rare guests who do make the journey often bear the telltale signs of discomfort. My father hesitates a moment and sighs deeply, bowing into the kitchen and clicks his tongue once a signal I take to follow and let the Imperial inside. He throws the musker legs he'd been holding onto the countertop, and the meat sizzles softly as it lands on the cool surface. Tend to this, Malachi, he says, his voice strained. I sense a creeping sense of unease crawling up my back, holding my shoulders tight as I try to F.O. cuz on the meat. I know that if I'm caught snooping, it will only make things worse, so I concentrate on the task at hand trying to drown out the converse Italian but unable to stop my curiosity from getting the better of me. Both my father and the Imperial move to the family room. We don't have any doors to separate it from the kitchen, but they are past the wall, so I have to strain to listen. The low murmur of their voices drifts toward me, but I can't quite make out the words. I told you and all of them back there I was done. There's no more left to give. I'm out of that business. My father's voice is kept to a hush. I understand your desire to retire, but a soul dear is not what we need, and you should consider yourself lucky that we're not here for that kind of call. Lucky? You want me to thank you, after everything. My father's voice quivers with a mix of anger and bitterness. Lucky is not something many people are these days, Logrith. I think you'll find that you should want to hear what we need because I'm trying very hard to keep your luck going. I hope you understand my drift. I finish scraping the burnt remains out of the pan and place them in a small bowl. My fingers work with precision as I season the meat, the fine grains of salt and pepper clinging to its surface. The sizzle of the meat hitting the hot pan is a satisfying sound, and the enticing scent of searing meat begins to fill the kitchen. The crackling of the meat as it cooks is a constant background noise, the aroma growing richer and more mouth-watering with each passing minute. 
However, it's not enough to pull me from the conversation beyond the wall. Quite a pup you've managed to raise, all things considered. The Imperial remarks, and my thoughts shift from concern to confusion. What kind of person has the audacity to enter another man's home and talk so flagrantly over things he knows nothing about? However, I'm uncomfortable considering that maybe I was incorrect in that assertion. It seems my father and this Imperial know each other very well, adding to the list of questions about my father's past. Speak of nothing but your duty. My father spits out. What is it you're here for, then? Hurry, before I rake out that tongue of yours. Threats are only such if the threatened con ciders them serious. I know you're not capable of following up on those words, because that would surely cause much disturbance for your space here, no? He waits a moment longer and then continues, I hate to. Imagine what my father's face looks like to a retort like that. Emperor Eugolius is requesting a sword from the finest swordsman he knows, and you should be so lucky to be that very person. Surely there are better smiths in the Empire? The dimly lit room is shrouded in an aura of palpable tension, thick enough to be sliced with a blade. In the background, a pan crackles and hisses with charred meat, its aroma mingling with the growing uncertainty in the room. Ah, but you contain the special quality of knowing what kind of qualities makes for an effective weapon, more than any two-bit smith looking to work a rags-to-riches job. We're looking to cut out the process of eventually working our way down to you, not to mention that special metal of yours that we've been ever so kind to let you borrow. The Imperial, a figure of authority and power, leans in closer to my father. His arms remain tightly clasped behind him as he speaks. Crimson eyes bore into my father, conveying a sense of importance. There's a calculated sternness in his voice as he addresses the matter at hand. I can't help but feel drawn to the clandestine conversation. I take a cautious step closer, keeping to the shadows as I observe the exchange between my father and the Imperial. The room's flickering can glee light casts elongated shadows, adding to the overall mystique of the encounter. There's none left. My father's words, though quiet, resonate with determination, hovering in the air like an unresolved chord in a somber melody. The Imperial's stern laugh breaks the silence, reverberating in the confined space. The room seems to tighten its grip as the Imperial laughs, underscore ing the gravity of their discussion. His crimson eyes remain fixed on my father, and there's a tangible pressure in the atmosphere. You should know better than that to lie, the Imperial says. Of course, if that were true, then surely there'd be charges of theft to be brought up. An investigation would have to be performed. All matters of prodding work I can bet won't end well. A question hangs heavy in the air, like a sword poised to strike. My father finally asks, What sort of sword is our dear emperor looking to have made? I discreetly observe, noticing the complex history that lingers between the two men. The imperial's lips curl into a subtle, knowing smile. He leans back slightly as if acknowledging the weight of my father's reputation. His words are laced with a blend of courtesy and authority. The emperor desires a sword that could rend the heavens asunder, the type of blade that fits his highness' true power. And imagine, the smith that could forge such a blade would surely be praised. I yearn not for Yug's praise. My father's response carries a touch of defiance. The Imperial's gaze remains locked on my feather, and for an ephemeral moment, an emotion akin to pain flickers across his features before being concealed by a mask of professionalism. They're like old acquaintances with a history too intricate to discern fully. So be it. The Imperial responds, breaking the silence, and his tone hints at a veiled agreement. Then the avoidance of his wrath should do you much benefit. Will one of your men be sent to pick up the sword once it's complete? He really trusts that it will. Not be absconded in the interim? My father inquires. The Imperial's laughter fills the room, a fuller and heartier sound that clashes with the tension that has been building. His confidence in the success of his plan is unmistakable. Of course not, you will be delivering it. 
I can't have all my men exposed to these environments. I'm not too fond of it for the short time I am here. No, he can't. I'm stepping into the room before I can stop myself, and immediately I find both pairs of eyes setting solid on me. Malachi, what are you doing? Return to your station. Well, the pup has decided to join us after all. Well, Logrith, he's what, 17 now? Surely he has a voice in the matter now. The Imperials attend tie shifts to me, and I feel the weight of the room's focus on me. He is not to be involved in this situation. My father's voice is firm, and he directs a deep stare at the Imperial. The Imperial, undeterred by my father's protests, continues to question me. Well, pup, I'm... Sure you know I hail from Emperor Eugolius himself. I'm curious why you think this job shouldn't be done. I swallow hard, the room's atmosphere becoming increasingly stifling. My inner turmoil is inescapable, with the conflicting voices of fear and determination waging war within me. The shadows seem to close in, but I find the strength to speak. Because my father cannot make the journey. He's got a limp and wouldn't make the trip off of Cadian. There's no way he can deliver this sword. My voice wavers, but my resolve remains unbroken. My words hang in the air, a declaration of my unwavering stance. The room falls into silence, and the Imperial's scrutinizing eyes assess me. My father's gaze shifts between me and the Imperial, his own inner struggle apparent. The cane propped against the wall offers a silent testament to my father's physical limitations, and it seems to trigger a moment of understanding in the Imperial. I see well then, pup. What will you do about that? The Imperial's response is cryptic, a subtle test of my determination. He will do not dash. My father begins, but the Imperial interjects before he can finish. Logrith, the pup has shown himself capable of barking. The room seems to squeeze the air from my lungs, my legs threatening to give way beneath me. A bead of sweat forms on my forehead as I try to find my voice amidst the turmoil. I will go in his stead. This was the answer he was looking for, I'm sure of it. Given the circumstances it made sense. But I hate how this situation put us both at the Empire's beck and call. Malachi, no. You're going to do no such thing. Vago, you've gotten your fun. I will have the sword delivered and that will be that. The atmosphere in the room grows more steep fling with every passing moment. I catch a glimpse of the Imperial, Vago, as he taps his fingertips together, his gaze calculating and ever so slightly malicious. His words are laced with a veiled amusement, relishing in the discomfort of our situation. The dimly lit room accentuates the tension as he speaks. You see, therein lies the stickiness. Vago's words hang in the air, almost tangible. The Emperor has given this task a matter of two months before its deadline is reached. And well, it's taken us about half that time to deliver this message here. My father's voice drips with exasperation and frustration. You've given us only a month to fulfill your insane demands? Vago returns a dirty look and places his hands on his sides. It isn't any concern of mine how much time you have left considering you are the one who chose to live so close to the god's domain. So high up, really a dreadful location. He turned his head and coughs without covering his mouth. Really, you only have yourself to blame for how long you have left. The Imperial's condescending remarks continue, marked by disdain. Well then, you better hurry on and get started. He smiles as he passes me, moving into the kitchen. Looking up at the ceiling, the patches that still needed fixing from last month's storm catching his eye. Really quite dreadful. He continues. My father's patience wears thin, and he forges ahead, his voice seething with indignation. You can't seriously. Vago interrupts, adopting a sardonic tone. Oh, the Empire seriously. The room reverberates with the weight of our impending obligation. His mention of payment and punishment looms ominously, like a storm cloud casting a shadow over our lives. 
The Imperial's attention shifts to the musker leg, left sizzling in the pan. He seizes the opportunity to assert his dominance, his gloved hand reaching for the meat. The act seems to mark a point of no return, emphasizing the power the Empire now holds over us. I reach out in anger, but my father stops me with an outstretched arm. He didn't turn to face me, his eyes still staring at Vago. I could tell though his look was to the both of us. Don't push your luck any further. Vago smiles the look of a weasel and departs from our home, the sound of the door closing taking the tension of the meeting and replacing it with the horror of all that was to be. A month to make a sword and deliver it crossed Oralithian borders? It took them a month to make it here, although I doubt they were traveling at their abso. Loot fastest, probably trying to see how many hours they could burn. My father stands frozen, his eyes locked onto the door through which Vago exited, as if contemplating a bleak horizon. His arm, once tense, falls limply to his side, and he becomes a statue of contemplation. The oppressive silence in the room seems like an impenetrable fortress, and I dare not be the one to shatter its walls. Finally, my father speaks, his voice heavy with reproach. It was a foolish thing to do, boy. A tremor runs through me, but I refuse to back down. I couldn't let you take that job, you would have died on the way down. His response is stern, reminding me of his role as the protector. It was not your place to say. My chest constricts with the weight of unsaid words, and I'm compelled to reveal my innermost fears. If I remain silent, the burden will become too great to bear. I can't lose you. The admission startles my father. His eyebrows twitch ever so slightly, betraying his expected tie-in that I'd argue about my readiness. In a rush of emotions, I speak of things I've kept hidden for years. I have always wished I could have saved mom. I, the word feels foreign on my tongue, and the room seems to hold its breath as I ut it. I think about her nightly. I think about the stories you used to tell me, and I wonder what quest I could have embarked upon to bring her back. I can't go through that loss again. It would break me. My father's silence stretches, and I can sense the turmoil inside him. I wish he would reciprocate and share his thoughts. The dam has been breached, and the words spill forth uncontrollably. I want to save you. I want to hear the stories you haven't told me, and if you go out there, they die with you. Mom dies with you. My father continues to gaze at me with a piercing intensity. The lines on his face reveal a struggle within, a battle between his paternal instincts and his knowledge of the world's harsh really ties. He finally closes his eyes and sighs, surrendering to my unspoken plea. Grab my junk sword from the back, he instructs. You're going to need to go out and find more food. Try to gather some Kaiser shells while you're at it. We'll need them for the hilt. Father, I say, exasperated, my voice barely above a whisper in our small, cluttered home. Obey your father's command and do not return until you've procured them. He orders, the weight of his words heavy with a worry he can't quite express. His voice trembles slightly as he speaks, and I sense that the whirlwind of events has taken its toll. I can't remain rooted in one place for too long. There's a growing restlessness inside me, a relentless tug of responsibility that's come far too fast. As I trail behind him, I pass by his entry into the only forbidden room in our small home. It's a stark contrast to the days when I would sit on his lap in his grand chair, enthralled by the tales of adventure from long ago. I wonder if that old chair even still exists, or if it's been dismantled and sacrificed to make ends meet. The junk sword, a relic of long-forgotten batlees, rests in its corner, a somber reminder of the challenges that await me. Its blade, once gleaming with the valor of its past, now appears tarnished and neglected. The dim light that filters through the room casts a sinister glint upon the blade, mirroring the grim task that lies ahead. As I grip the hilt, I can feel the roughness of its once majestic surface, a texture that mirrors the worn and battered state of the sword. The pommel, heavy and unyielding, serves as 
an anchor, grounding me in the harsh reality of the perilous world beyond our safe haven. With each step I take while carrying the sword, it feels like a burden. The blade's weight digs into my shoulder, a relentless reminder of the responsibility I now carry. I ensure that the clasps occur ing the sword sheath is tightly fastened, signifying my readiness to embark on my journey. As I step outside, the bustling town of Kadian greets me with a cacophony of sound and color. Merchants set up their stalls, their wares displayed in a dazzling array of hues and textures. Children run and play in the streets, their laughter echo ing through the air like the tinkling of bells. The gentle hum of daily existence fills the air, a symphony of life that washes over me like a warm embrace. The sun ascends higher into the sky, its golden rays casting dappled patterns on the cobbled streets and towering buildings. The air is crisp and clean, with a hint of sweetness from the nearby Bach area. I inhale deeply, savoring the moment, knowing that it may be my last for some time. The clinking of the junk sword against my back creates a stark contrast to the lively scene, a dissonant note in the symphony of life. It serves as a poignant reminder that beyond our cozy sanctuary lies a world where survival often hinges on the sharpness of a blade and the unwavering spirit of its wielder. I adjust the sword on my back. Time to hunt. Chapter 2 Lonely Hunter the days we had together were some of the most special in my recent recollect. I yearned for the eternity we thought we would have had. As I lay here among the infinite vastness, I think of where it all could have gone wrong. I have my life right in front of my eyes like a scattered timeline of death and devastation. I need simply to put the pieces in order and uncover the truth. The bustling sounds of the markets are the first thing to cross my ears as I shut the door behind me. Kadian as a whole is accustomed to rising before the sun, considering how bleeding it tends to be with us so high up. Get the hardest work done before it rises so you can take advantage of the day, they say. So seeing everybody at their finest as the golden glow casts over. I pass by the butchers. Roderick is the owner, a burly man with a thick mustache that twitches like an agitated caterpillar as he expertly wields his cleaver. His shop is a veritable symphony of steel. Against bone, producing a rhythmic melody of cleave ing that competes with the town's morning chorus of birds. I have a pretty good relationship with him, considering I'm lucky and able enough to help him secure meat for his trade. Sorry Roderick, today I have to fill my own plate before I offer extra. The tailor's shop is next up on the block. Its facade is adorned with a colorful array of fabrics, swaying gently in the morning breeze, a riot of colors that dance like whispers of dreams in the making. Johan, the tailor, is a stout man with spectacles perched at the tip of his nose, meticulously sewing a garment by hand. His shop is a realm of intricate patterns and rich textures, where bolts of cloth stretch like vibrant tapestries. You should get those holes in your shirt fixed, Ezra won't give you the time of day if you look like you've been dragged from the gutter. The thought is pushed back down when the reality of how pricey Johan's services are becomes apparent. At this point, buying a whole new shirt altogether would be cheaper. But that also requires the kind of coin that we can't really afford to part with. I continue past the tailor's and the cartographer's office. I cross paths with Locus, the watchmaker hunched over a delicate timepiece as intricate as a spider's web. His keen eyes are hidden behind hair that he often has to brush out of the way, and he has a reputation for crafting timekeepers that never lose a second. The delicate tick-tock of the numerous watches lining his shelves is a gentle counterpoint to the vibrant cacophony of the market. The general store is a bustling hub of activity, with goods piled high on wooden shelves. Terence smiles and waves as I pass by the entrance. His demeanor makes it easy to see how easily it is for him, exchanging jovial banter with the locals. His store is a treasure trove of odds and ends, from farming tools to exotic spices. It's a place where everyone in Cadian knows they can find a little piece of what they need. The cobbled streets are alive with vibrant call ores and the rich scents of various foods from market stalls. Crowds of people, dressed in a patchwork of clothing styles, 
weave through the thoroughfares. Vendors call out to potential customers, their voices competing with the lively chatter of the townsfolk. The aromas of freshly baked bread waft from a nearby bakery, mingling with the rich scent of spices from a spice merchant's cart. Laughter and cheerful banter create a warm atmosphere with children playing tag and adults haggling over the prices of various goods. Birds flutter and chirp, adding their melodies to the lively soundscape. It makes me anxious, thinking about all the kinds of goods and wares for sale that are just plain off limits. Not until you get a hefty sum for completing this commission from the emperor, at least. I sigh. I hate everything that Vago guy stood for. But I can't lie and say that the Emperor's coin was as good as any, especially when it comes in large volume. A sword from the legendary end blacksmith would go for something hefty too. Of course, that then meant we were directly supporting the war effort, and I already hated how tense things were now, what with the Empire and the Esther coalition being at each other's throats. If their fights spilled over into all-out war, it would surely cause undue mayhem for each of the other border countries that would inevitably get caught in the crossfire. Esther would surely call upon Verdantia and Judicis for assistance. A call that, like my father's own choice in this commission, would be coerced into cooperation. That would leave the empire to strangle its hold over Cadian and those mysterious folk down in Obscurd into an all-out brawl. I sigh, my gaze sweeping over the townspeople Pieli who seem oblivious to the weight of world affairs, focusing on trading, laughter, and camaraderie. The town, a tapestry of life, forms a stark contrast to the impending chaos of the world beyond. I shiver and grip my arm tight to center myself. Through my exhale, I look up to the darkened morning sky, hoping for a way to escape it all. I reach the outskirts of Cadian where the province's landmass meets the wildlands beyond. Our humble town is encircled by wildlife, providing us with some self-sufficiency. While we must import certain essentials, we're fortunate that the local muskers and kaisers, our sustenance, thrive on the fringes of our settlement. I venture into the wildlands and spot a musker almost immediately. These weasel-shaped creatures are formidable, nearly as long as I am. They're known for burrowing and construct ING intricate subterranean nests for their burgeoning offspring. Without my and a few other local boys' EF forts, our town would be overwhelmed by these pests, outnumbered five to one. Thankfully, muskers don't put up much of a fight. A well-aimed blow behind the head with my trusty junk blade paralyzes them, ensuring a painless death. I confirm each kill with a heavy heart, steeling myself for the task at hand. I hoist the lifeless musker onto a basket, as securing it with sturdy straps for transport back to town. Muskers are relatively easy to handle. Kaisers, on the other hand, are more difficult. Kaisers hang from trees, attaching themselves to the branches with spit-like sap. They're crab-like creatures with tough shells on either side of their three claws, shielding the soft flesh underneath from damage. They remind me of large pine cones but the worst part is when they get hungry. They drop on unsuspecting folk and dig their pincers into your neck before you can even react. A kaiser sways on its precarious perch, its bulbous body suspended by a thin strand of sap sticky web. The gentle breeze rustles the leaves around it, making the creature sway back and forth like a grotesque pendulum. Each movement reveals the segmented armor-like carapace that covers its entire body. I weigh my options with the hilt of my junk sword clenched in one hand. The Kaiser's setup is perfect for an ambush, and I can't resist the tempt to tie in to disrupt its peaceful meal. Picking up a handful of small stones from the forest floor, I aim carefully and let the first one fly. It sails through the air but overshoots the Kaiser, Kao Sainji it to twitch slightly and glance around, its yellow eye stalks emerging to inspect the disturbance. Heart pounding, I draw in a deep breath and throw a second stone. It strikes the Kaiser's armored carapace, making it swing erratically, but it remains suspended. The creature's eyes dart around, trying to pinpoint the source of the intrusion. My last stone hits the mark, 
connecting with the delicate sap point that binds the kaiser to the tree. The connection shatters, and the kaiser plum nets to the forest floor, a high-pitched screech of surprise emanating from its mandibles. I pump my fist in victory and grip the hilt of the sword with both hands, closing the distance between me and the fallen kaiser. My intentions are clear, but my excitement gets the better of me. With a mighty swing, I drive the blade into the kaiser's leftmost segmented carapace. The curved hooks sink ing in. I manage to rip away a chunk of the armored shell, but I miss the vital organs beneath. The kaiser wriggles and struggles to regain its footing, its spindly legs flailing against the sap-soaked web. I seize the moment, recognizing the creature's vulnerability, and kick up a cloud of sand with my boot, blinding the creature. Agonized, the kaiser convulses, desperately trying to clear its sixth shown. In that split second, I raise the sword high above my head, my muscles straining with effort. I bring it down with all the force I can muster. The blade plunges between the kaiser's eye stalks, splitting its grotesque head in two. A sickening squelch accompanies the impact as the blade tears through the creature's carapace. Black, viscous icar pours from the wound, drenching the forest floor as the creature's eye stalks droop. The kaiser twitches in its final throes of death, the grotesque twitching of its limbs slowing until it lies still, lifeless. I exhale, my chest heaving with the exertion, and yank the blade free from the kaiser's lifeless body. The creature's blood mingles with the sap on the forest floor, creating a grotesque tableau of death and decay in the dappled sunlight. Thank the gods that our blood is different colored. I don't think I could manage the hunt if they weren't. I pierce the kaiser's sturdy shell with the sword of the end, and a cacophony of grating noises fills the rocky landscape. The blade's gleaming edge tears through the creature's tough hide with formidable power. Each motion is deliberate, a testament to my determination, as I carefully peel away a substantial portion of the kaiser's meat, ensuring it remains intact in my hand-woven basket. With practiced ease, I sheathe the junk sword, a patchwork weapon crafted from assorted components and specifically designed for tasks like this. Its leather and bone hilt feels unwieldy in my grip. The pommel, etched with the weight of its numerous encounters, serves as a grounding reminder of my responsibilities. The morning sun begins its ascent, its gentle rays stretching across the desolate landscape and casting a warm, golden hue over the horizon. The world slowly awakens, bathed in the ethereal glow of dawn, as a chorus of birds welcomes the new day with melodic songs. The filled basket, laden with the fruits of my labor, hangs heavily from my shoulder, a tangible reminder of the toil and purpose that define each day. The weight bears down on my lower back, and the persistent pressure gives rise to a dull ache that core. SES through my muscles. With a determined yet weary sigh, I shift the load on my shoulder, seeking a more balanced and comfortable position for my journey. The woven basket's handle, rough and slightly frayed, grounds me with the reminder of the responsibilities I bear and the contributions I make to our small community in the city. I can almost feel the gratitude in the air as I move through the tranquil landscape, carrying the promise of sustenance with each step, ready to face the challenges of a new day. Just as I'm about to resume my journey, a sudden den voice pierces the early morning quiet. Look, guys, the rats have come up for their morning meal. Quick, somebody go protect the bakers lest they break in and inflict their plague. Oh, Levios, have mercy! The voice is all too familiar, and it freezes me in my tracks. I curse silently, realizing that I won't be able to avoid trouble even on this early morning excursion. Cody Stowes, the ringleader of his mischievous gang of friends, steps out from the conceal ING shadows with a malevolent glint in their eyes. Cody, for as long as I can remember, has been the closest thing I had to a bully in these parts. I've often managed to steer clear of most of his antics by virtue of not attending the local school. We could never afford the entrance fee, a rather ironic twist considering that my father and I essentially constructed that very building. While I haven't had much direct interaction with Cody, his reputation looms large, and every encounter we've had in the past has been nothing short of negative. 
It's almost amusing to think that he, of all people, would invoke Levios for his misdeeds. Last I remember, Levios granted favor for those of the working class. I responded, attempting to maintain my composure. All about pushing forward the common good and freedom. Cody's face contorted into a sour and contemptuous expression. He took a step closer, and his voice dripped with disdain as he addressed me. You've always got something to say, don't you, End? Seems like that big mouth of yours gets you into trouble. You know what your name means in the low talk? Bad End, the kind that your mouth leads you to. His words were laced with both mockery and aggression. Without warning, he shoved me forcefully in the chest, making me stagger backward. The impact sent a jolt of pain through my body, and I struggled to maintain my balance. The confronted tyannal atmosphere between us seemed to intensify, and I could feel the tension building as we stood on the precipice of a potentially explosive confronted tyann. I stagger backward, the unexpected force of Cody's shove taking me off guard. For a moment, I teeter on the brink of falling, the filled basket sway ING in my hands. Desperately, I fight to maintain my balance, shifting my weight to keep from toppling over. Cody's taunts continue, each word carrying a malicious edge, as if he savors every syllable. His voice drips with derision, echoing through the bar in alley. Can't just run forever, errand boy. He sneers, his grin revealing a row of crooked teeth that seem to embody his malevolence. He takes another step closer, invading my personal space, and I can feel his hot, rancid breath against my face, a stark reminder of his proximity. One of his friends, a smirk. ING accomplice with shifty eyes stands just behind. Cody, reveling in the confrontation like a hyena CIR cling its prey. He emits a low chuckle, an eerie soundtrack to the tense atmosphere that has settled be. Between us, it is clear they take pleasure in my discomfort. Cody's words cut deep, attacking my pride and family's reputation. Nothing without that ruddy sword of yours that looks like it came out of a Sarah Nope's asshole. You're the offspring of a smith, and that's the best you could do? They laugh. Their voices erupt around me, a cacophony of jeering and mockery that reverberates through the narrow alley like a cruel symphony. It's as if all the alley's inhabitants have emerged from their hidden nooks to join in the spectacle. My instincts scream at me to retreat, to find an escape route from the tightening ring of onlook airs, but it's already too late. They've sensed my unease, my desperation, and they move with a kind of collective predator's cunning. Like a pack of hyenas encircling their prey, they close in on me with precise choreography, their eyes glinting with cruel delight. I'm trapped. Every angle of retreat is blocked, and the walls of the alley press in on me. It's as if the very stones themselves conspire to hem me in. I'm caught in the middle of this predatory performance, and there's no way out except to face the humiliation and the imminent physical confrontation. Cody inches closer to me, his oppressive presence undeniable. He bears the unmistakable air of leadership, with his closely shaved head and fiat tours that exude raw, untamed anger. A chiseled chin framed by a scowl, and his piercing green eyes are like shards of ice that cut right through me. Without warning, he delivers another forceful push, and I stumble backward, unable to keep my balance. The contents of the heavy basket I've been carrying spill out onto the unforgiving cobblestones. My frustration and humiliation surge through me like an electric shock, sending a jolt of adrenaline coursing through my veins as I scramble to regain my footing. Each beat of my heart reverberates within my chest, its rhythm frantic, much like a caged bird desperate for freedom. The raucous crowd surround ING me revels in my vulnerability, their laughter growing louder with each passing moment. It's a relentless chorus of mockery, echoing through the NARO alley, and it claws at my very soul. As I drop to my hands and knees, my palms scrape against the coarse, unforgiving cobblestones, leaving a trail of bloodied skin in my wake. The pain is sharp, but it pales in comparison to the searing embarrassment that floods my senses. Every moment spent in this degrading spectacle feels like an eater. Nighty, 
and I'm acutely aware of every pair of eyes fixated on my struggle. I can't bear to meet their taunting gazes. My focus remains consumed by the humiliating task of gathering the scattered goods, seeking refuge in the monotony of it, even if only for a brief respite. A sudden, searing pain shoots through my side as the hilt of the junk sword jabs inward. I wince, a strangled sound escaping my lips, but it's all but drowned out by the cacophony of merciless laughter that surrounds me. Cody, the ringleader of this torment, wears a malicious smile that seems to widen with each expression of pain on my face. His eyes gleam with a malevolent delight as he savors my soup fearing, basking in the power he holds over me. The twisted pleasure he derives from my humiliation fuels the relentless cruelty of this performance. Ah, uh, poor baby fell and spilled all his fill. He taunts in a mocking, sing-song tone. What's baby gonna do? Baby gonna cry about it. Summoning every fragment of my remaining dignity, I muster the strength to push myself to my feet. The humiliation and physical pain threaten to keep me down, but a fiery determination burns within me. I know I can't allow them to see me broken and defeated with a voice that quivers but still. Carries a hint of defiance, I croak out a single word. Leave! Cody's shrill, mocking laughter reverberates through the narrow alley, a cruel symphony of torment. Leave when things are just getting good? I wouldn't dream of that for the world. His voice drips with a toxic disgust as he speaks. With a cruel, contemptuous kick, he delivers another brutal blow his foot landing squarely in my gut. The force of it expels the precious air from my lungs, leaving me gasping for breath. But the relentless onslaught of laughter from Cody and his cronies only intensifies, each peal of amusement driving the knife of humiliation deeper into my wounded pride. One of Cody's lackeys joins in on the mock airy. Yeah, he's the wimp who freaks. Cody, Unable to contain his malevolent glee, extracts a makeshift knife from one of his pockets. The early morning sun gleams off the blade, casting an ominous gleam upon its cold, unforgiving edge. A heavy feeling settles in my stomach, my heart pound ing with fear as the dreadful reality of the imminent danger I'm in becomes starkly evident. No. I croak, my voice weak and trembling, still struggling to regain my breath. Cody continues to mock me, twisting the knife in his grip. The crowd's laughter seems to go on forever as I find myself trapped, a helpless target in their cruel game. I skin the faces around me, search ING for any sign of mercy or intervention, but there's none to be found. Their grinning faces are like a cage, closing in on me, suffocating me in this nightmare. He laughs, a guttural, malicious sound then draws his blade across the tip of his index finger. The blade slices through his flesh effortlessly, and a bead of crimson forms. He raises the bloodied finger, taunting me with the macabre sight, adding a grotesque element to his sadistic performance. Isn't this fun? He hisses, his voice dripping with malice. His cruel eyes unnerve me. His gang joins in the gruesome display, their laughter and jeers deafening. Helpless and isolated in this hostile world of taunts and torment, my heart pounds and my stomach churns with dread. I draw in a shaky breath as my gaze focuses on the droplet that forms at his fingertip. My vision narrows and the world spins. Panic courses through my veins like wildfire and the metallic scent of blood overwhelms my senses. My heart hammers in my chest, each beat residential onyateng in my ears like a thunderous drum. The crowd's laughter, once a distant cacophony, now echoes in my head, an unrelenting chorus of cruelty. My breath comes in rapid, shallow gasps, and I feel as though I'm drowning in a sea of humiliation and fear. In that moment, every instinct in my body screams to run, to escape this nightmarish ordeal. But my trembling legs refuse to obey, keeping me rooted in place, a captive to Cody's sadistic game. My world has shrunk to that one menacing droplet of blood, a symbol of my helplessness, and I can't tear my eyes away. No, please, I mumble, my voice trembling. My heart hammers in my chest, 
and I can feel the color draining from my face. Cody leans in closer, his grin widening to reveal his crooked teeth. His blade inches closer to me, its glint threatening to pierce my skin. The crowd's laughter grows louder, echoing like a cruel symphony in the narrow alley, drowning out any hope of escape. My mind races, searching for a way out of this horrifying situation. The metallic scent of blood fills my nostrils, and the world spins around me. My trembling hands clench into fists, and cold sweat trickles down my forehead as I struggle to maintain my composure. The bitter taste of fear lingers in my mouth. Cody senses my fear and circles me like a predator stalking its prey. His mocking laughter and the cruel jeers of his companions echo in my ears, doubling over themselves like an echoed cacophony in the growing light. The world becomes a nightmarish haze as I struggle to control my rising panic. The sight of the blood, so vivid and real, sends shivers racing down my spine. My breathing becomes erratic, a desperate struggle for air as though I'm drowning in a sea of terror. My heart pounds in my chest, its frenetic rhythm like a war drum. Bow claws its way up my throat, and I clutch my head, my fin jeers pressing hard into my temples as I fight to stay grounded in this nightmarish reality. Around me, the world warps and bends, shift ing into a grotesque and distorted version of itself. The laughter of the cruel crowd seems to echo through a dark abyss, a chorus of torment that claws at my senses. The cobblestones feel unforgiving beneath my trembling hands, their texture an eerie reminder of the cruel and unforgiving world in which I'm trapped. The menacing glint of the blade remains etched in my vision, like a malevolent specter haunt. ING my very soul. My mind's a whirlwind of dread and confusion, and I struggle to distinguish between past and present, between the torment of my childhood and the horror unfolding before my eyes. Cody leans in even closer, his laughter grow ing more sinister by the moment. You know, I've always heard about your little fear, he taunts, his voice dripping with cruelty. How cute that you can't handle a little blood. But let me show you, Malachi, there's nothing to be afraid of. As Cody's taunts continue, my heart pounds in my chest, each beat reverberating like a relentless drum of terror. His cruel gesture, a simple flick of his blood-stained finger in my direction, is enough to send panic surging through me like a tidal wave. My composure rapidly erodes, and I feel my grasp on reality slipping away. The world around me blurs, distorted by the surreal and nightmarish haze that envelops my senses. My fear is a tempest, tearing through my fragile control, leaving me exposed and helpless, at the mercy of my tormentors. The jeers of the crowd intensify, and their voices swirl around me like a maelstrom of cruelty. It's a sensory overload, the sight and smell of blood a nightmarish symphony of horrors that threatens to drown me. Just when I feel like I can't endure this humiliation any longer, a shadow falls over the group. It's as if time itself has warped and shifted, and I'm thrust into a surreal dreamscape. The sensation that erupts within my chest is unlike anything I've ever experienced. It's a profound and overwhelming surge of emotion, a mixture of relief, awe, and a profound sense of empowerment. It feels as though something deep within me has snapped, and I'm no longer the vulnerable boy but a force to be reckoned with. I become an observer in my own body, detached from the reality unfolding before me. Time slows down, and the world becomes a surreal tableau. I feel the junk blade click out of its scabbard, the F.A. familiar weight of the weapon in my hand. It swings with effortless grace, a blur of motion, as if guided by some unseen force. But who's in control? Who has taken the blade into their hand and wielded it with such determination? Cody's triumphant expression shifted to one of shock and disbelief as he stumbled back, clutching his injured arm. Blood welled from the gash I had inflicted, staining his fingers crimson. The crowd's laughter faded to stunned silence. The cruel symphony abruptly halted. I blinked, my mind struggling to comprehend the sudden turn of events. It was as if a dormant power had awakened within me, a force I hadn't known existed. My hand still held the blade, 
trembling with the aftermath of the strike, and I could feel the weight of it in my grasp. Cody's cronies stepped back, their taunts silenced by the sight of their wounded leader. The NARO alley, once a prison of humiliation, had transformed into a battleground of uncertainty. We scream simultaneously, a chorus of terror and agony that pierces the tense air. My scream is guttural and primal, accompanied by a nauseating surge of bow rising to my throat. The strength drains from my trembling arms, and I can no longer bear the weight of the heavy sword. It slips from my grasp and falls onto my frail, shuddering body. I don't even register the impact, my eyes fixed on the shocking scene unfolding before me. He bends down, his gaze locked on the source of the searing pain. Blood steadily drips down to stain his shorts, forming an unsettling pool of crimson. It's not a fatal wound, but the jagged, oozing gash is far from a pretty sight. Let's get the hell out of here, he roars, his voice tinged with urgency and panic. His crew M.E.M. Bears waste no time, their expressions oscillating between confusion and concern. It's clear that I've ceased to be their primary focus, and they hurriedly retreat, leaving me alone in the alley. My tongue swells in my mouth, and my throat tightens as I tremble uncontrollably. The world blurs as my body convulses, and I find myself shaking violently on the ground. The sword slips from my legs as I'm carefully rolled onto my side. With a sudden, now seating lurch, what little remains of last night's dimness spills out onto the unforgiving cobblestones. A pitiful, quivering cry escapes my lips, a mere echo of the torment that churns within me. Oh gods, are you okay? The voice is familiar, but I can't focus on it for longer than a second as the tremors send the Bauris ING up my throat once more. What in Velo's name happened? There's only one person I know who defaults to Velos for guidance over Levios with a voice like that. Ezra. She pats my back, her touch gentle yet firm, and turns me back around to face her. Her striking golden eyes, glistening with worry, are the first thing. I see. Her similarly golden hair is neatly tied up behind her, and I can't help but wonder if it's been done to prevent my nausea from getting any worse. Her face is etched with a profound sense of concern and guilt, and the overwhelming concern in her eyes somehow begins to calm my trembling body. In a strange way, her presence becomes a stabilizing force, gradually quelling the relentless shivers that have overtaken me. I cough once to clear my throat, which is still burning. I take a deep breath and look back up to her. I'm fine. The last thing you are right now is fine. Was this related to Cody and his gang running like a pack of babies a few moments ago? I offer the weakest smile I can imagine. The thought of it offers the slightest bomb to my mental state. Did he start some shit again? She curses so casually. I admire that. Something like that would have poisoned my throat worse than the bile. He saw me and that was enough to start it. I was gathering some material and grub before the markets opened up fully. I, I think I blacked out for a moment. Must have cut himself on my sword somehow. Her look was suspicious. I could tell from her eyebrows immediately in the way they sat down. That cut seemed a bit more deep then. She began, but she stopped. Never mind. It's okay. I think, I think it's calming down. Thank you. I've known Ezra for quite a few years now. She had moved to Cadian with her parents when she was younger. Her family immigrated from Judicis, Esther's border state with the Empire. She's unfortunately come to find out about my avoidance toward blood in probably the most embarrassing way, counting this experience. It was something she showed support for back then, but I was so averse to talking about it I avoided speaking with her when I saw her out in the markets shopping for her family for a few weeks afterward. You really don't have anything to worry about, she says. I know it must be something that is insurmountably difficult to deal with. Insurmountably difficult didn't even begin to describe it. I felt so idiotic. I could take a number of muskers and kazers out, see their lifeblood drip out. 
and it would only very minimally bother me, mainly for the grossness factor among everything else. But I'd be okay. I do this for a living. And yet, my mind's eye replays the gruesomeness of that cut, and my entire body retches. I shake my head. I'm sorry. I, I really don't understand why it affects me that way. I, I'm acting inappropriately. I should think you would, she says, her voice firm in a way I can't explain but find more reassuring than I deserve. I mean, we all have fears and things we'd like to avoid. And some of us are lucky enough to be afraid of things that won't likely appear in our lives. I'm sure that must be better than all this. I say, offering another cough and covering my mouth before it leaves. In some ways, Ezra says, but I find the things I'm scared of, for example, tend to paralyze me in my sleep. Completely unimaginable sights beyond mortal comprehension. Things like gigantic mechanical behemoths with powers unimaginable to rewrite history or, gods forbid, tax collectors. I can't stop the burst of laughter that escapes my mouth, a sound that elicits a smile from her. I'm glad to not to have to fear the tax man yet. If you're going to take over the family boosie ness, you'll learn soon enough, Ezra says, flipping a metal plate onto a work table in her father's shop. The clang of metal on metal echoes through the space, filling it with the scent of oil and the comfort ing aroma of iron shavings. Do you? I ask, my eyes tracing the intricate patterns on a nearby gun barrel. The faint whiff of gunpowder hangs in the air, a subtle reminder of the craftsmanship that occurs in this workshop. My father's eyesight has been weakening the past few months, Ezra continues. Nothing so serious as to affect his mobility, but I've been assisting with his paperwork as of late, so I've had to learn that side of the business. Ezra's father is Kadian's most trusted gunsmith. Her expertise in handling firearms leaves faint traces of gunpowder on her hands, and I can't help but admire her skill. Besides, she says with a grin, it helps to have a better eye on the financials since my father of ten makes mistakes that his daughter wouldn't. Well, I can tell you must be very good at it, I reply. Many people don't have a knack for things they don't try, Ezra says. Amid our conversation, the comforting aroma of freshly baked bread wafts in from the market outside, blending with the mechanical sense of Ezra's world. The delicate dance of smells and sounds Siari attach a unique atmosphere in this shared moment. Think you can stand? It must not be comfortable down there, Ezra asks, her eyes filled with concern. I take a deep breath and sit up. Yeah, thanks. I would have gotten my bearings together eventually, but I would have been defenseless if they regained their courage and came back to settle the score. Ezra's eyes hold a warmth that goes beyond the terror I had felt minutes earlier. I deserve no thanks more than the ones you gave initially. I feel the heat rising to my cheeks, and I look off to the side to hide my embarrassment. Besides, she says with a wink, a trace of CIT rust perfume wafting around her like a hint of mice terry. I'm sure if they came back, they'd find some way to accidentally jump on your sword again. You're okay with picking up the musker, right? Ezra asks as she bends down to collect the scattered pieces of Kaiser carapace and sets them inside a woven basket. Oh yeah, of course, that's not a problem. I reply, adjusting my grip on the musker's limp body. Its fur is soft and slightly ticklish against my fingers. It feels heavier than usual, probably due to my own weakened constitution. Once we have the musker in the basket, we continue on the path back to the market proper. Well, I really appreciate you helping me out. I say, ready to part ways and save myself from any further embarrassment. And risk you toppling before you make it back in one piece? I don't think so, Ezra says. What could have sounded condescending sounded, jovial like we had been friends for ages and it was a common jab and expectation of one in equal measure. But we hadn't been friends for ages. She was so obviously above what I could muster, I. 
could only return a nervous chuckle and even felt stupid for that much. Come on, at least let me escort you home like a proper savior, and then we can part. I smile small and blush as I nod, the junk sword kept tight at my side, the ominous feeling of that ever-blinding whiteness not yet set at bay. We step into the kitchen, and I'm aware of Ezra's curiosity as her eyes sweep across our small, cluttered space. The room, adorned with the remnants of our daily life, I can't help but feel embarrassed at how messy it is. My father turns to face us, his eyes perceptive at first, but a frown creases his brow as he takes in Ezra's presence. The atmosphere is thick with ten shown as his gaze sharpens. Malachi, why have you deviated from the job? My father's voice is sharp, his words resonating with the weariness of a long day. My fingers subconsciously trace the handle of the junk sword on my back, the worn, scarred metal beneath my touch rough and unforgiving. The metallic scent hangs heavy in the air. Ezra stands beside me, her presence a contrast to the rough, familiar surroundings. My father's. Words cut through the silence, demanding attention, and the clinking of the basket on my back adds to the layered symphony of sensations in the room. I close my eyes to regain some sense of balance. I haven't. I say, then open them to look at my father. I gathered what I went out for. I was seoarned by Cody and his gang on the way back home. They... My eyes shifted down to the floor. They were causing me some trouble and Ezra stepped in, offered to walk me home afterwards. I see. Well, given the nature of our work, I must ask that you leave my son so he can cook us up a meal before he joins me. The tension in the room is palpable as my F.A. the directs a pointed statement at Ezra. Before I can respond in her defense, she takes it upon herself to withdraw, her departure a silent admission of defeat. My father nods her off, and her footsteps fade away. I'm left alone with my father and the enigmatic contents of the basket on my back. Malachi, I want you to promise me something, my father says, his voice more serious than I've ever heard it. What is it? I ask, my voice tinged with CU riosity and apprehension. That girl is trouble, he declares, his words etched in steel. The clinking of the basket against my back reverberates with the tension in the room. I don't want you associating with her anymore. I AP appreciate you getting home safely. And I'm sure you'll tell me more about this trouble with that miscreant out there, but you mustn't associate with the likes of her any further. I stutter, my confusion mingling with disbelief. To hear him say it so brazenly, I can't believe how stern he's being about this. How can he be so unyielding over a matter that doesn't truly affect us? All because someone's moved on to his turf of smithing? How cruel can you be to someone who doesn't affect you in the slightest? I question it silently, because I know all the good that voicing that opinion would do. The kitchen is now a mix of conflicting emo tie-ins. My father's insistence feels like an injustice, the air heavy with unspoken words and unresolved tension. Yes, father. Now, hand me those shells and please get us some food going, he says, redirecting the converse a tie-in. Come join me in the back once you're done. He continues. The smells of our daily life, they're calm. Fortang familiarity, underscore the tension that lingers. You can help me sculpt the hilt. I nod, defeated, and proceed to take out the shells, their rough surfaces rasping against my fin jars. The clinking of metal against metal accompanies my movements, a silent reminder of the unsolved conflict. The room is filled with the soft crackling of the flames in the forge, and the distinct aroma of metal melds with the comforting scent of freshly baked bread. I arrange the shells neatly on the workbench, their surfaces cold to the touch. My father watches me intently, the lines on his weathered face reflecting years of dedication to his craft. He sighs before leaving the room, and I am once again alone with my thoughts.